Um, but I am kind of uh, in seeing this conversation, uh, which I like to say is the conversation with the future of American theater, the present and future American theater. Um, so what this is, is we are here because of an organization called Enough. Um, and it is a fabulous idea uh, that was dreamt up by Michael Cody. Um, who gathered some great theater minds, I'm quite honored to be among them, um, to read plays that writers all over the country, who I believe are 18 and younger, um, have submitted based on um, the idea of the, the braiding of arts and activism around um, anti-gun violence and gun violence prevention. And who you see gathered are uh, some of the folks who have been chosen. They are award-winning playwrights who have written brilliant, just wildly poetic, deeply naturalistic, just genres all over the place, brilliant, heartbreaking um, short plays that show the range, the absolute range of the human lived experience um, of living in an era where gun violence in this country is so sadly predictable and prevalent. So we are here to talk to these incredible folks about who they are, why they write, why arts activism, um, and uh, get a sense of what this incredibly brilliant and brave generation um, is, going, is offering us uh, uh, on the stage. So I would love everybody to um, kind of let's popcorn around. Once you share your name and pronouns, you can pop it over to somebody else and we will meet everybody and then start chatting. So once again, Lauren Gunderson, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Sarah Schechter, would you go next, please? Absolutely, thank you. Hello, my name is, is Sarah Schechter and I use she, her pronouns. So excited to be here. Um, Aja, would you like to go next? Oh no, I think we might have we might have lost Aja. Vanished. Vanished. Okay, hopefully, hopefully she'll return soon. In the meantime, Ridley, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi there. My name is Olivia Ridley. Um, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I wrote Ghost Gun, and I am so, I am yeah, so grateful and excited to be here. Thank you. Um, Adelaide? Hi, I'm Adelaide Fisher. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I wrote Miss Martin's Malays, and I'm also very excited to be here. Can you share who, who else should we go? Oh, I will send it over to Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Shannon. Um, she, her pronouns. I wrote Loaded Language, and I also am very excited and honored to be here. Um, Deb Kanya. Hi, my name is Deb Kanya Mitra. I use she, her pronouns. My play is called Malcolm and like everyone else, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, can I give it off to Aja? Hey, my name is Aja. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And just to echo everybody else, I am very excited to be here. Uh, Sarah. I actually already went, but I didn't say the name. I didn't of my get to go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, hey, I'm Islam Grayson. Pronouns are she, her. It's a total honor to be here. Um, I wrote Guns and Dragonland. Awesome. Well, I can tell you. Uh, so the way that this basically worked was there were uh, several finalist plays and my uh, fellow judges and board members of Enough got to read them all. And I can tell you the the really energetic discussion that went into all of these. Um, and we were all just so thrilled uh, to choose all of you because so much of what your work represents is the diversity of theater, the, the absolute range of aesthetic and style and, um, and, and everything that you can imagine. Um, some like startlingly theatrical and some just deeply brooding naturalism, character studies. Um, so I, 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 I look to you all um, for what's happening in the theater, what's exciting, what's next, what's now. Um, so why don't I start by asking you, um, when I worked, started with this organization, it made me think of who I was at your age. Um, and I remember thinking, not just that I wanted to write, but that I had to write. I just, I couldn't not, I just, I, you couldn't stop me. Um, and 
that drive and that passion and that kind of voraciousness uh, has really defined my entire career. And so I wonder at this point early in your career, um, what is it that makes you write, but specifically theater? Why theater um, as, your, as your form and your medium? How did you find this, this thing? Um, Olivia, would you start? Sure thing, yeah. Um, I think Art is such a, you know, a perfect and wonderful means of starting conversations, initiating change and kind of pursuing something greater. Um, and specifically, you know, theater, you, you have, you're given the advantage of having a live audience. And so you're able to have these, these discussions like directly with the people in front of you. And, you know, that that sort of intimacy is something that you don't find in other mediums. And so I think you know, I, I think theater is really just one of the, the most perfect ways of kind of trying to seek and foment change because in order to do that, you, you know, you, you start conversations and um, yeah, that, that's kind of, that, that's kind of what, um, what, what kind of like propels me forward when it comes to art. Awesome. Iceland, what is it, what is it about theater for you? Well, the theater is the closest you can get by taking a story and applying it to real life. It's the closest you can get to actually embodying that story and like legitimately living through it. Um, of course, disregarding like cosplay <laughs> and stuff like that, but um, that's cool too. But yeah, I chose theater because it's just, it's just so interesting and there's so much you can do and most people will, will argue like oh like I would rather watch a movie any day it's like well yeah like in movies you can do a lot but there's just there's just such an awesome challenge in writing theater and it's just it's so interesting and seeing it in front of you is just it's beautiful yeah yeah Aja, is the, did you ever consider writing any other kind of form or do you write poetry or short story? Was it always theater for you? Um, I've written like, I've always considered writing like poetry and short stories and just other different things. But I think dramatic scripts, be it playwriting or screenwriting or whatever. I don't know. I just, I think that they, they're a lot more rooted in naturalism and kind of what Olivia said, the intimacy between the audience and the actors, like, I don't know, something about that just has my heart. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's thrilling because I think we are so inundated now with great TV, amazing TV, all streamed movies that you can eat. Um, and to have such fierce minds as yours uh, in a young generation, to turn to theater, it to me further confirms there is something magical about the live performance. There's something necessary, it's urgent, it's primal. We're around a campfire, you know, um, and I, I applaud you all for, um, for having this be part of your journey. Now, I assume all of you will, if you choose to write movies and TV if you like, but um, the idea of always having a home in theater uh, is inspiring to me. Um, Sarah, what about you? Tell us about why theater, why, why writing for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess I'd echo everybody else that it's like a fundamentally just human like thing that it's representation at its core, that it's pure storytelling. And I mean, not to not to go, you know, poo poo any other like art forms. Those are all beautiful, you know, different uh, ways of representation and expression. But I think that theater is like so fundamentally human and grounded in character that everyone should be a playwright and everyone should be a theater artist because I think it helps you to appreciate humanity and narrative, you know, in a way that other art forms don't allow for. And I feel really lucky that I've been able to go to uh, art school in Oakland for the past four years in, in high school, which has really kind of grounded me as a theater artist and, and shown me that, you know, it's a conduit for so many other things, which eventually led to enough, you know, that you can explore any social issue that, you know, we're people, we can explore whatever's in our life, you know, no theme is too, too big. That's what I really like, like the Jose Rivera wrote like the 36 assumptions about theater. And, and one of the big ones that that's on there is that, you know, don't you can tackle anything in it um and i don't know that's pretty cool i love that hell yeah anything we can do it um dev kanya what about what about you what is your journey to, to theater so when i was in fifth grade a playwright resident came to our class and we had to write plays as an assignment for that 
like writing class back in fifth grade. And since then, I've just been doing it. Wow. What was it about that assignment that 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 inspired you? Well, I. Uh, I feel like I always liked theater, like I enjoyed watching theater, but that assignment kind of taught me that maybe I could, like I myself could have a role in theater other than just an audience member. Love that. Yeah, awesome. Um, Elizabeth, what about you? Well, like Sarah and Olivia and many other people said, I think um, the basis of theater is human connection. And I think everyone could use more human connection um, I think there's something special, really special about live theater when you can see the audience's reaction and how um, you can get such a different audience, audience reaction um, every time you do a show and the audience can take something away, a different thing away from the show. And I think that that's, that's really powerful, how you can impact so many people and in so many different ways. Um, and then also, you know, get to see that impact um, in a way that you wouldn't really with like film or TV. Um, and I also just, I've always really liked writing, but was for a long time kind of too scared to try it. And then I tried it and um, I've, I have been an actor for a lot longer. So it was a great way to be like, even if I'm not in a show right now or I didn't get cast in a show, I can always write. And this is another way I can like connect to art and connect to people no matter where or when it is. Can I just ask before we have Adelaide answer the question, how many of you are actors or? Yeah, we've got actors among us, some directors or choreographers. Yeah, great, all right, good. I, I, I find that there's a lot of actor entry points because you get the script, you do your lines, you get addicted to this form, this medium, this feeling, and then you're like, oh wait, there's other things? I can, I can write the stories too? Oh, this is great. Um, <laughs> so Adelaide, tell us about um, your journey to theater. Why theater, why writing? So I've been doing theater like a very long time. Both of my parents also love theater. So I've kind of always done theater and I've kind of done every side of it, like acting, tech, and then now also writing. So I just, I love to create pieces that like as an actor her and also as a technical person, I know that like I would like to do. I like to like create characters that I think actors would enjoy playing or would have a challenge playing. And I enjoy like creating technical moments that like, costume designers or directors or makeup people would like enjoy working on and would find interest in working on. I think it's fun to like take what I know I like to see and like the sort of characters I want to see and I like and kind of create my own version of them. That's so great. That's great. Love that so much. Um, awesome. Thank you all for sharing. All right. So let's see, you know, what the heart of this organization and why it means so much to me is that it is taking a social ill um, the prevalence of gun violence, especially as it manifests in schools uh, and younger populations and doing something about it and applying the artistic story, this powerful empathy, this powerful intimate human connection that you're all talking about that drove you to this form and using that to get us as close as possible to this cause, this, um, this problem that is so hilariously, horribly, uniquely American. Um, so what is it about arts and activism in this form? When you, when you started um, your play, uh, how, what was the first step? How did you find the story um, to tackle gun violence? How did you approach it? How did, what, what in you as a theater artist um, was kind of the first step to building to building your um, story. Uh, Adelaide, since you finished us off, why don't you jump in at the beginning of this one? Okay, so the first step for me really like was that. It was finding a story I wanted to tell because like thankfully in my own life, I haven't had a firsthand experience with gun violence. So I didn't have my own story to tell and I didn't have when I started, I didn't have any like particular, this is what I want to say, this is the kind of story I wanted to tell. So I eventually ended up talking to like a couple of principals, like my middle school principal and then my current high school principal right now. And like hearing kind of their like, as an educator standpoint on gun violence and like some of the things they have experienced in their teaching and principal careers. And then kind of like finding that story and being like, this is, this is the angle I want to tell. This is the story I want to tell and like the experiences I want to use. Amazing. Um, 
Um, Asha, what about your story? Your play is so so interesting and so intimate. Um, how did you find your your way of tackling this? Um, okay, so whenever I found the prompt for enough, well, not when I read it, I I had like I just knew in my mind that people were going to write about school shootings, and I was like, well, there's like other types of gun violence other than school shootings. And I went back to, I just thought about my life and where I am. And I'm from Mississippi. Uh, and like, there's a lot of gun violence where I live. And so there, I just, I just drew from that. And I delved into that a little bit more, a little bit deeper. And together, just came together. <laughs> um would you mind telling us a tiny bit about your story, Adelaide? I'll jump back to you as well after this so you can tell us a little bit about your, your play as well. Well, you know what, one second. I have been remiss in telling people how they can experience your plays. So before we, we um, tease everybody with the, the <laughs> uh, telling a little about the shore is, um, so what you're gonna see is 50 communities across the nation um, are going to be digitally premiering these amazing plays and readings from theaters all over the US. Um, they will all be streamed on Broadway On Demand. So you can go to Broadway On Demand, find uh, enough, and you'll be able to um, support this incredible, uh, thrilling production, um, but also see theaters and artists all over the country and see these great plays. Um, you can find out more on enoughplays.com. I'll probably say that about 10 more times during this stream, um, but yes, enoughplays.com. Okay. Uh, yes, and they are not just in, in the US, they're all around. Uh, I think they're in Europe and in Africa as well. So we are truly a global four continent force for good. It's amazing. Okay, so Aja, tell us a little bit about um, your play so people kind of know what you're talking about. Um, my play is about four friends, Cheyenne, Amani, Aaliyah, and Ayana. And they're at this graduation party because they just graduated, they're seniors, they're thinking about the past, the future, everything that lies in between. And out of nowhere, uh, someone comes up and they start shooting and Cheyenne gets caught in a crossfire and she dies. And it kind of just, towards the end, it just displays that type of, that type of anguish and the pain that the friends are going through. It's so it's, I mean, what I thought was so brilliant about it is it really does have capture that moment where you've learned so much in your 18 years and you are so ready for the future and to have so many lives be cut short at that moment of, um, of possibility. It just, I, I found it really, um, it's a really beautiful play. Adelaide, uh, tell everybody about, um, about your play as well. Okay, so my play follows this English teacher named Miss Martin and sort of like the thoughts in her head and the influence in her life personified as other characters, like as other people that she can hear and just sort of her conflicting thoughts and the things acting on her as she deals with what could possibly be a gun violence situation as she deals with someone on her campus who she knows having a gun. And then just sort of like an exploration of the deeper story there. Yeah, and to me that was so, um, impactful partly because it was one of the few plays that was written about an adult, uh, a teacher from the teacher's perspective. But the idea that of course this doesn't just stop at kids and an entire community is affected, your everyday way of life. Even if there is no actual active shooter situation, you are still on edge and that stress is just seeped in um, across, across communities. So I thought it was a really interesting thing. All right, um, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about your play and kind of how it came to be. How did you, how did you start writing your, your story? Yeah, so my play is called Loaded Language. It's about um, five high schoolers um, who are in their, their, it's at the end of their third block and one um, overhears two of them talking and she thinks that she hears them say that there's going to be a shooting in the next block. So she starts um, freaking out and has to, and she tells her friends and then they have to decide, you know, do they tell their teacher? Or did she hear them correctly? And kind of um, weighing all of the possibilities of what could happen. Um, I had this idea right away when I read the prompt um, because a kind of similar thing happened in my sophomore year biology class. 
And so I knew exactly that I wanted to write about, I knew right away immediately, that's the word, that I wanted to write about, um, about friends who, how there wasn't a gun, there wasn't a shooting and they were still so paralyzed with fear. Um, and then I read in the like description that they didn't want to see a gun if possible. That was one of the like suggestions. And then I was like, oh, my play doesn't, doesn't even have one. Um, <laughs> I got, I was like, yes. And then, so that's what, that's how my play came to be. Um, and I almost like what you just said, Lauren, about Adelaide's play. I just wanted like how it's, it's so ingrained in our culture and in the back of everyone's mind. Um, like I remember there is a video of it was like a car backfiring in Times Square of, I don't know, a few years ago and how everyone started running. Um, and that was that similar kind of fear. And then I also wrote a bunch of, two of the three scenes in my play are like kind of Greek chorusy. And I took um, things I had said, I had thought, or people had said to me um, or that I'd heard all about gun violence and guns in everyday lives. And there were like so many, I had to cut some because there were just, it just kept going. I kept thinking of more things I'd heard, which was like really terrifying, but. Yeah. Um, yes, another profound example of, of how guns are everywhere, even if they're not there. <laughs> um, so I certainly remember thinking that. Um, Aislinn, what about you? Tell us about your play. Yours is a very creative, surprising take. <laughs> um, we were all, I remember having lots of great discussion about, about your play with the, with the judges being like, this is amazing. What is happening? <laughs> so tell us all about it. <laughs> ah, that means a lot. Thank you so much. Um, so I usually write satire. Like that's my niche. Like that's what I go to. And the thing about satire is that if you want it to be effective, things have to be super emphasized and super theatrical. Like that's that's just my take on it. Like, of course, there's a million ways to do satire, but that's how I like to do it. And so, of course, I didn't want this show to be another satirical piece because like satire usually relies in like comedy and stuff. And like, I was like, no, I don't. Like, of course I want like elements of humor, but it's not funny. Um, it took me a little bit to think of an idea. It took me like a week or so because I knew I wanted to do something kind of outrageous just to highlight how outrageous this problem is in our country. And I just, I don't remember if I had this conversation in that following week or previously, but it just, it somehow came to me I had this conversation with my little brother who's eight years old and I was like I was in the car with him and my mom after we picked him up from school one day and he was like oh yeah we had a we had a drill today and my am like okay so <laughs> so I had to like I, I was like asking him about it and I was like oh so like why why did you have a drill and he's like oh well just in case there's a bad man who comes in and we all have to hide and it was just like oh my god like this is like a game that's so it's just it's just it's so unbelievable that it really affected me and it's like that's my brother that is the love that is everything I love <laughs> right there. I adore my brother. And just to like imagine if it wasn't a drill and to see like how he would think just inspired me and just to write this show. And of course I wanted to, I wanted to use more personal elements of like my childhood because I don't really know how it is being a, a third grader and 2020, but I know how it was in, oh God, don't make me do math. <laughs> I don't remember when I was in third grade, <laughs> but um, whenever that was, 2000, what, 11, 12, 13, in that area. So yeah, I just, I used like children's programming and I used that conversation with my brother and it just kind of came together. So yeah, it's guns and dragon land. 
Depends in Dragonland. Um, Olivia, what about what about yours? Kind of a very different approach, <laughs> certainly from Iceland's play. Um, tell us a little bit about your show and kind of how you put it together and what were some of the creative decisions that that made that made it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, kind of similarly to Aja, I felt as if after I found out about the project and everything it you know stood for, um, I very quickly realized that there, like, gun violence is such like a just a far reaching issue where like it is especially prominent in schools and that should not be dismissed and should be discussed. Um, but there are like so many other aspects and components that just aren't discussed enough, I feel. Um, one of like, you know, in addition to school shootings, I think race and class also have a, a significant presence um, in the conversation and should, and like in, in this entire issue. And I wanted to find a way to introduce this prospect, um, to, to, to introduce it into the conversation and, you know, um, to justify why we need to be talking about this component too. So that's kind of how Ghost Gun came to be. Um, you know, it is a monologue. Um, it is a monologue coming from a young black boy who, you know, appears to be armed and is speaking to his audience sort of like held at gunpoint, um, not physically held at gunpoint, but they know that he is armed. And so it, it's just about, you know, his, incessant just want to, to, to be heard, um, to, to finally be looked at and listened to. Um, because like we hear a lot of people talking about black men and like their depictions of, you know, you know, their depiction of black men, which is either like some inherently aggressive or violent, you know, person or they like completely victimize the black man. It's it there's and there's no in between and they're not allowed to be complex or multifaceted people. Um, and I wanted to introduce that. And, you know, in addition to that, of course, something like gun violence involving death and violence, like it traumatizes people. It is scary. And like, you know, the notion of a black man being scared of being insecure and, you know, on the verge of tears, like, you know, it, it's just never really thought of, uh, you know, I feel like in, in in general, just like conversations how people choose to speak about black men, they are always deprived of like any sort of sensitivity. Um, and that's not accurate. <laughs> that, that's not accurate at all. If a twin brother and, you know, a father who shares, who fear, who, you, who are scared and who cry and like, you know, I, I think that was really important to res represent, especially, you know, in the gun violence conversation that's so it involves, you know, all of these very scary things, um, you know, yeah, uh, so that that's kind of what, what, what kind of like ghost gun, how, how it was shaped, um, just kind of the the insecurity, the insecurity of, you know, some, a lot of young black boys and, you know, their sense of their place in the world and really them not feeling like they have a place in the world. Um, yeah. It was a, a particularly bracing and beautiful, beautifully written play um, that yes, we all agreed instantly <laughs> about how much we, we responded to it. Um, so yes, that's, and you know, I will say a one person play is, it's really hard. It's hard to, to build that engine and to have the, the plot have any sort of churn to it um, being a, a solo. So it's, it's an extra accommodation to you for, for taking on that challenge. Um, Deb Kanye, what about you? Tell us a little bit about your brilliant play. So, so I wrote my play in June when there was a lot of media attention and the public was very concerned about police brutality deaths across America and even like around the world. So I feel like my play came out of like a place of grief. Like we were all kind of collectively mourning the death of like police brutality victims. So my play focuses on the journey of this black man named Malcolm, who's a folk musician. And he kind of goes on this journey for self-discovery, but his ultimate success is cut short by the fact that he becomes 
a victim of police brutality. And I kind of, I knew that was the particular story I wanted to tell because like I've heard pieces of it from different places. Like I've met people who have had life experiences similar to that, but because I've never had that life experience, I was a little bit hesitant about trying to trying to tell that character with my kind of language. So then I settled on the idea of having four adjacent characters who are in Malcolm's life try to reconnect, like reconstruct his story after his death. And something that I think is particularly important, and I hope people that watch my play see this, is how because Malcolm suffered a uh, death at the hands of police brutality incident, his perspective on the story is lost. We aren't directly able to see his emotions. We can only construct with what we have left. And I think that says something important about like the people we lose because of police brutality. Like friends and loved ones can talk about who they were, but we never really get it from the person we can't. Such a savvy way to create a character out of nothing, <laughs> to your point. Um, it's one of those kind of form and function, uh, the co content and form conversation that the point you're trying to make socially and uh, as an activist is made in the way that you wrote and, and how you tell the story of somebody who's not there. Um, quite lovely, quite lovely. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, tell us about your play uh, and how you wrote it. How did you decide to put together this great thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, actually, I'm, I'm really glad that the Pony just went because it made me remember kind of this initial like thought that I had once after I saw the enough prompt. And that was that, like, how do I write about gun violence? You know, I was like, this isn't, you know, a story to tell. This cuts people's stories, you know, people's lives short. So what what do we do from that? Um, and I was, I was like <laughs> stumped for a good few months and I kind of was a last minute um, writer too. But like Aja, I think that I kind of had this thought where I was like, where I come from, gun violence exists outside of school shootings, um, more so than other places. Like, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I didn't, you know, it was it's not my place to write about the history of, of gun violence in Oakland particularly. and. I didn't know how to write about my own scary, you know, kind of run-ins with gun violence, um, you know, from like being smaller to, to growing up, um, including a few like, yeah, scary like little moments where I was, you know, where a, a live shooter was. And um, yeah, this was kind of in June, I guess. So uh, there's uh, a lot happening, kind of a lot of public reckonings with, with white supremacy, I guess people were, starting to have that conversation and then I was like I have no idea how to write about school shootings how to write about all this and I had this one line come to me which is like red white and blue I don't know some graphic and I was like I'm American like uh white crosses red blood and blue lives and these were kind of these like three things that I was like seeing and then I from that I built this monologue that um was kind of about the just bizarre kind of less like tangible parts of gun violence throughout American history. And that turned into a monologue um, that is like unhinged ringleader uh, <laughs> who it leads this show with different acts of American history kind of um, using little sections of gun violence. So yeah, I was trying to show that gun violence exists outside of school shootings and also existed outside of this century that even though, you know, our generation has kind of had like gun violence just seared into like our, our consciousness that we were born right after Columbine. We were in elementary school with Sandy Hook and we, you know, I was in my freshman year of high school um, when the Stoneman Douglas shooting happened in Florida. And I mean, I keep on repeating myself we've been in a few interviews together so sorry all <laughs> you have to listen to me say like the same things but it's still in my head um still still truthful uh so I was kind of like yeah what if we go back further than that and then afterwards I read it and I was like oh my god this is like a little crazy but I was like okay you know might as well lean into it so so that was what I tried to do with, with hullabaloo well yours is a great example of kind of taking what is inherently serious and um, mortal <laughs> and heavy and like flip, doing the opposite, like having the opposite feel of this 
circus delight atmosphere kind of come crashing into this very serious, um, dangerous topic, which I thought was really successful because it's whiplash. You know, the, the, the aesthetic you're going for is just like a, just a, just an explosion. Um, and I think in many ways there, there again, the, the form that you chose has the impact of, of uh, being, a, being a moment, a kind of attack, <laughs> aesthetic attack. Um, so it's it it a really great example and how, how striking and different um, kind of all of, all of the judges are like, I would have never thought to have write <laughs> this. It's just amazing. Um, so all of you, I covered all the plays, right? There's, there's, yeah, okay. Um, uh, I, I, I do think it was quite a privilege for all of us um, uh, as the judges to, 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 to really dive into your work and to get a sense of the, diff, the breadth um, of what, what we got to, to read and to see and then to actually get to, to see it in a, in a production. Um, can we chat a little bit about production in a pandemic, reading on Zoom on, um, I'd love to know how y'all are handling that. Um, how, are there any discoveries that you're having and as this point in the process, um, I'm sure y'all have been in rehearsal at, at least some at, by this point um, and uh, you know, starting to see the work on its feet, on its Zoom, Zoom feet. <laughs> um, but I'd love to know what that's like for y'all. I think every theater professional in almost, you know, certainly in, the, in this country is, having the same experience in terms of how, to, how does the work change, grow, you know, suffer um, in this strange medium that is so disassociated. But, um, and also we have the great benefit of sharing these stories so widely. So I'm, I'm thrilled for, for you and for us that we get all of these stories. Um, enoughplays.com, enoughplays.com, enoughplays.com. Um, but I'd also like to, to maybe sprinkle that in with your reactions, some advice. Uh, for other writers who are your age or younger, um, who are thinking, well, I've never written a play. How do I even do that? Should I do it? Um, what is the, what is any advice about writing, about arts activism, about writing that first play, about writing your 10th play? <laughs> um, anything that you've discovered or learned uh, during all of this would be fabulous. Uh, Elizabeth, would you start us off? Yeah, of course. Um, so for the first half of the question, um, I mean, obviously I miss live theater. Um, I think the main thing I've gotten from this experience and I've actually had a few other plays that have been like streamed um, and worked on over Zoom is that I've gone to meet so many people I never would have met. My The um, theater company that is doing my show for Broadway On Demand is in Southern California and I'm in Maryland. So I would have never met those people and it's just so amazing and um, earlier today, we did an inter I did an interview with a, um, a theater company in Arizona that's part of Enough, and like I never would have met those people, and just getting to meet so many people who care about this issue as much as I do, um, and all of my playwrights, oh my gosh, all of you too, who I never would have met, um, getting to meet them and talk with them and learn from them. Um, I It's kind of hard for me to compare, like, my show over Zoom because I've never seen it live, but I think at least for mine, it it's worked well over Zoom and I'm happy and I my actors were incredible and my director and assistant director were incredible. So it was a still a great experience, even though it was digital. Um, my advice for people who are trying to write um, plays is just to write something you're just, you're really passionate about. Um, I think that's how I started. I had, there were other social um, issues that I really wanted to write about and that really um, stuck out to me. And I think that will give you, if you have that passion, um, it will give you the motivation to keep writing. Um, and you'll also just, you can come from such a, a more real and human place if you have those, those real feelings and those things you really want to tell people and you want the world to hear. It's amazing advice. Uh, Olivia, what about you? Zoom reality and advice. Yeah, um, I, actually like after, so after we finished producing my piece, which because it was a monologue, like we were able to film it, like instead of it being over like Zoom, it was um, filmed in front of a green screen and has all of these effects. And it's really interesting because right right after we, I was speaking with the director and he was like, yeah, it's, it's I mean, 
like he had a completely different vision beforehand where he wanted to like film outside and like all this other stuff and so at the last at the last second he had to shift gears like right away and so because it just wasn't working and with like regulations and lockdown like he was just like yeah I don't think this is gonna work so um we ended up something like completely different than what um we were you know, planning. And, you know, that is not necessarily a bad thing. And that, that has been such an interesting, you know, process incorporating like, kind of like digital editing into something that was written for live theater. Um, it's definitely very interesting and has been really, really interesting to see, to see. And I'm also extremely grateful that I was a part of the process, um, you know, involved in you know, navigating the whole editing and process. And, you know, that has just been really, really cool. Um, and, and you're kind of, theaters in Chicago, is that right? Yes, in, 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 in Chicago. <laughs> so and it, Jason is your actor, is that right? Yes. Jason, he was in one yeah. of my things. He's so good. He's so good. Oh, he's wonderful. Like, oh, perfect. Yeah, no, no, I was absolutely thrilled. And like he, you know, first of all, I as a side note, you know, I am a female writing for a male character. And so I'd like read the play alone in my room in a female voice. And so it was like shocking to hear like the bass of a male voice. It was very exciting. Um, yeah. And, and regarding advice uh, just for writing, I, I think just I always ask myself, you know, what what is a conversation you want to be had? Um, and like, even if your work isn't explicitly like for like the sake of activism, kind of just like, you know, what world are you trying to reflect? What are you, you know, what is the purpose uh, kind of of your piece? Um, and also just like, I think we are so, I mean, I'll say this and you know, it's hard to really like take into consideration, but like, you are always like your your own harshest critic and it's always hard for me to write you know without like deadlines or whatever like it's hard for me to write because I'll start and then I'll hate it and I'll stop um and you know that's that's that you won't produce anything you won't produce anything and so you know if you set timers for yourself if you set like arbitrary like deadlines have a friend keep you accountable just but like practice your writing and don't be afraid to sound stupid and you know to mess up because that is the only like I cannot stress that enough that is the only way you learn that is the only way you learn and get better and you're going to remain stagnant if you don't try at all um yeah I think yes <laughs> that's because that's that's what gets you to the end to the end and once you get to the end once you have the first draft however shaky it is however many holes there are that's the draft that'll get you to the better draft, the better draft, the better draft, the better draft. And you can't, can't finish the thing if you don't finish it. <laughs> so yes, I think that is perfect advice. Don't be afraid of looking stupid. Don't be afraid of writing something that's a little weak at first. That's the way it gets better. So brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, all right, let's see, uh, Sarah, tell us uh, your Zoom experience, your what it's like at this point for you and advice. Definitely. Um, I think that I don't know, I would just kind of approach it all with, you know, being honest, whatever that means for you. For me, that was kind of like, oh, like, damn, Zoom theater is very challenging. Like, I had a, a play produced in um, June or July virtually, and I was like, oh, wow, like, this is crazy stuff. And then I actually, like, I guess I it didn't, the lessons from that didn't really sink in until I actually just watched um, the version of Paul Blue virtually that, um, I actually like, I wish that I had changed my plays a little bit because writing for Zoom is different. Um, it simply is, that's a fact about it. For some people, I mean, for some of these plays, I think they, you know, could be transposed perfectly online and that's fantastic for my play. I, I wish I had revised it a little bit for, for Zoom um, because what we were talking about earlier is that it's fantastic that plays can exist in so many different mediums. They're live, they're like static, they're dynamic. You can read them, um, they can be brought to life. And um, yeah, for me being honest means that, you know, we have to embrace that, you know, maybe we have to acknowledge that this is different. Um, and it, 
like requires you to be introspective and honest about your work is this you know what are the main things that you're trying to you know show the audience and give the audience that are going to be different um i think specifically around like gun balance i was thinking back to the plays that like i mean office hour by like julia cho or like natural shocks like um are about you know what are the is the tension of like having the audience it all being in one space like with you know guns is that like an important part of the show for me i think it was so like be honest, lean into the challenges. This is exciting. I don't think it's super temporary. If we're going to be doing this now, I don't think it's going to stop. So start, you know, I, I'm, you know, I was like, eh, you know, virtual play is an actual play, but now it is like, we got to deal with it. That's cool. Um, fun things will come out of it. So yeah, let's, let's lean into it. That's fabulous advice. Yeah. I think, I, I think you're right. I think some version of virtual theater will be with us and it'll just get better and better. And we'll know more about what the heck we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Iceland, what about you? Um, ironically, I just got out of like my first live theater performance I've had in so long. Um, but yeah, Guns and Dragonland is also live, but of course it's recorded, but it's live. And that's something I noticed that was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> like I, I was expecting the boxes because I also had a few plays that were performed via Zoom. And it, I don't know, it's just, it, it's so interesting. Like I wouldn't discount it as any less of an art than if it were in person. I think they're about the same level. I mean, of course, it's a bit disappointing not to be able to see people but I feel like there is art in it in its own special way um as for advice I believe that anyone can write just like ratatouille anyone can cook but <laughs> anyone can write um but it takes a true storyteller to be able to commit and finish a work that is the most difficult part of writing is sitting down and doing it <laughs> but um also write what you know but if you don't want to write what you know i recommend writing something that you know absolutely nothing about that is just out there that you can make up for yourself and make people make your own rules and make people believe in this world that you've created yourself so yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> I love that. Write what you know or don't. <laughs> and if you don't, go big. <laughs> um, that's that's fabulous. Uh, Adelaide, what about you? All right. So very similar to Eslin, I was also just finally able to start doing live theater again myself and my piece is being produced live. Ours is being done by the same place. They're both being done by the Orlando Rep. So both of our pieces were able to be done live, just like socially distance wearing masks which for my piece actually worked fine like it wasn't exactly weird in any way or anything i but in during this period of time i have also done a little zoom theater i have also like watched a little zoom theater and i do agree that it's it's a little different and it's a little bit different of kind of an art form i think there's like almost a different skill set i think definitely being able to like keep that level of energy with like no audience that you can see there to kind of give you the energy. Cause I think sometimes actors definitely get like energy from people watching you and you like feed off of the crowd. And so there's like something to be said for being able to still have that commitment and have that energy doing it for no one, like pretty much just doing it for yourself and doing it for the other people that are with you. So it's been it's been fun to see my piece produced live. I went to like a rehearsal for it. It was fun to meet everyone being in it. Um, and I think there's definitely a couple of theaters out of like all the 50 that are doing it that are doing it on Zoom. So I definitely want to try and catch one of those and like see how it's different and kind of see what they did. That's right. Um, <laughs> these plays should be available as scripts as well. So yeah. once this pandemic subsides, which thank you, Vaccine, I think will be sooner than later. Um, I look forward to live productions of all these plays as well. And then for advice, I think I would just say to like, not be afraid to write, like not be intimidated to write. I was actually just 
kind of talking about this with one of my theater directors and he was saying like I want to write like I have ideas I have ideas for scenes I have ideas for stories but like I'm scared that I don't have like a message I don't have like a full story to tell and I think just like my advice is don't be scared by that like if you have an idea if you have even just a scene like write it and then keep writing it and like just see what it turns into because you don't have to have like right off the bat a very deep message and a deep story you want to tell like work on it and I think you'll kind of find it along the way or you'll like hear it from other people even after they read it or even see it performed like don't don't be intimidated by the idea that you automatically have to have like some big commentary or some big message just like tell the story that you have and like it will have an effect on people. Devkani, what do you think about that? How's your experience and, and what have you learned? About, about Zoom theater? Yes, yeah, sorry, my son has just crept in, so we may have some commentary. So uh, around the same time that I wrote this play for enough, I also wrote like a Zoom play, like a play that literally was supposed to take place in a Zoom call. So when writing that, it was really amazing because it was just a new set of constraints. And it was sort of nice to be thinking, you know, thinking differently. And honestly, I was just so excited that any theater was happening at all. So it was great. I enjoyed it. I have had opportunities to watch Zoom theater. Like, for example, I go to the University of Maryland and they had their like their playwriting showcase on Zoom. And I feel like they did a really good job and I think nothing was lost. Instead, there was just something different. The directors really were able to like leverage Zoom as a platform to give us something different and to kind of focus on every single character. So I think I benefited by being able to see like their emotions even more clearly. For my play with the Arizona Theater Company, I was involved in some, not involved, I attended some of the production <laughs> meetings. And it was super exciting to watch like a lot of people taking interest in my work and adding their own creative ideas to it. When I wrote Malcolm, I sort of imagined like you know, four people sitting in chairs reading off of scripts. So like the director, costume designer, and like, you know, I, we had sound, we even had an animator. And I feel like just so many people added so much that I just had not been expecting. And I have not seen it yet. I want to, I'm going to see it tomorrow with everyone else, I guess. But I, I'm super excited to see what they do with it. And it's, it's just so much more than I imagined. That's tremendous. And I resonate with that every time I'm in a production meeting and see what designers or graphic designers do with, you know, poster design. It always just, that's why I write plays, I realize. <laughs> I just want to see what the costumers do. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, uh, that's really awesome. Azure, what about you? Why don't you close this out with some, some of your wisdom? Um, okay, for Zoom, my play was completely, I'm a very, very, um, I guess, Easter egg type of writer. I like being able to hide little things in the background and over Zoom, not much of a background. It's just four boxes talking to each other. And I think that is what really taught me how to, or that taught me how to, I guess, hide the Easter eggs in the language and how they say what they say and how they do what they do, not necessarily in the house or the trees or whatever is around them, but in them like by themselves. And my piece of advice would be, be creative, not profound. My uh, teacher, smartest woman I know, she told me that last year when I was like struggling writing something, I don't remember what it was, but she looked at me and she was like, be creative, not profound. It doesn't have to be 
quote unquote good, just make sure that what you're writing, you can stand behind it. And something else that I would like to say is whenever you're writing, if you're writing a play or whatever it may be, don't think of it as a work of art. Think of it as a conversation between you and a piece of paper. That's going to make it go so much smoother, so much easier. It's going to make it so much more beautiful too, just to see the raw emotion and the raw power behind the words you say. So that's all I've got. Oh my God. I love that. You create enough profound because to me, what that means is if you're trying to push a message, if you're trying to say something, it's going to feel like you're saying something, not that you're writing theater, that you're writing characters that are iconic and human and all of this. So the idea of you know, right, being creative, you're going to find it will be profound. You don't maybe know, may not be profound to everybody or <laughs> to all the people you want it to be, but it will be to somebody. And if it's true, if it's, if it's you, <laughs> um, if it's theatrical, that's such great advice. Oh, that's wonderful. And it's like, kind of like relaxing advice to you. You're like, oh, right. I don't have to like write Hamlet draft one, like we're, we're okay, just write something that's meaningful. <laughs> and I think all of you watching, combining all of the advice you've heard <laughs> will make quite a great um, play out of uh, somebody. Um, we are at the end of our hour, oh man. Um, but thank you all so much for sharing your time today, your advice, your thoughts, um, and a, a bit of a, a kind of a window into your, your brilliant minds and your creativity. And um, I think all of us who have gotten to know your work and some about you through your work, um, the only thing we wanna say is more, more, more. Keep, don't never stop writing, keep going, please. We want more, the theater needs you. Um, so thank you for your, your bravery with the pen and your brilliance and your empathy. Um, it really is such a pleasure to, to be a small part of your creative journeys. And for all of you, enoughplays.com. <laughs> you can see these <laughs> amazing streamed works from all over the world. Um, ah, so cool on Broadway On Demand. Thank you, Broadway On Demand. Thank you, Michael Cody. Thank you, Enough. Thank you, all the people who've supported Enough. So many of you donated um, during Giving Tuesday, and we're so grateful. Uh, this is really such a unique program and something that means so much to me. So uh, I'll open the floor at the end if anybody wants to do any last minute shout outs or highs or whatever, but um, I encourage everybody just go see these plays, support these writers. You will not be disappointed. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, my bad, I cut over it, but like I, it means the world to, to hear that from you. Thank you to, to, yeah, to Lauren, to everybody here and to everybody watching, to Michael Cody, because anyone who's, you know, watching is is part of the project now too. So thank you for, for being part of this. I literally like feel so lucky. We are lucky, the world is lucky to have all of your work. Um, <laughs> so keep up with these, these writers too, everybody. Um, thanks, go buy your tickets and stream and watch and tell everybody about it. Um, I know I will be. All right, thanks everybody, have a great night.